conclusion is a very subjective conclusion and simply happens in our mind. All right, so he concluded that if you had a resurrected Jesus in your life, that wasn't a historical Jesus. That was actually a Jesus of your imagination. It was a Jesus of your own making. A little bit closer to home, about 100 years after that, in the 1900s, our culture said something like this. They said, belief in an objective revelation of Jesus, resurrection of Jesus, excuse me, although perfectly legitimate and intelligible to the first century, cannot be taken literally and seriously today. The resurrection is, ser- is simply a spiritual experience for the disciples. And it didn't actually take place. Past cultures aren't as smart as we are. They're not as intelligent as we are. Let them believe in all of that stuff, but, but we're more sophisticated and we actually know better than they do. Uh, Thomas Oden is a, a really famous church historian And he defines this mentality in this way. He says, The modern mind and the postmodern mind is a mentality found especially among certain intellectual elites which assumes that recent ways of knowing the truth are self-evidently superior to all pre-modern alternatives. All right, so in other words, my conclusion about the resurrection is superior to your conclusion about the resurrection because mine is newer. It's more recent than yours. So in the the last 300 years, what our culture has developed is a redefined resurrection. The resurrection is a misunderstood non-event. It's a myth, a figment of our imagination, or it's just a spiritual experience that was given to the the disciples. Now, why is that? And here's my answer. Because in the last 300 years, we have slowly come to an iron will determination that everything we do and the reason that we exist comes down to our feelings rather than the truth. Everything is is redefined based on how we feel about it rather than truth. The autonomous individual is sovereign over all and the final arbiter of any perfect and holy truth. So we don't believe something if it doesn't make us more comfortable, if it doesn't make us feel good about ourselves. And the message of Jesus, the message of the resurrection, is not a message that immediately elicits comfort and good feelings. It's a message that immediately elicits terror and fear, especially in the eyes of the disciples and those who firsthand witnessed it. And it tells us this, The the message of the resurrection tells us that we are not in control of our lives. This morning, I want to read through this short passage on the resurrected Christ. And it's, it's almost as if Luke has penned this for our generation and for our time in a culture of skeptics that consistently look to science for verifiable proof, objective proof, and the truth of every single thing. And we're going to see three modern tendencies as we look at Luke 24, verse 36 through 43. Tendency number one, to spiritualize the resurrection. The modern mind has a tendency to spiritualize the resurrection because if we can spiritualize it, it is much less threatening. The second thing we tend to do is distance ourselves from Christ. If we can distance ourselves from the resurrected Christ, it's much less demanding. And the third thing we do is we refuse to come to Christ because it's much less redeeming. In his book, uh, Reason for God, which I really would recommend it to you this morning, Tim Keller wrote A Reason for God, and it's it's not a new book. It's been out for a while, but it's a very good resource to um, verify the claims of Christ and the truth of Scripture. And he says this, If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Changes everything. All right, number one, number one in your outlines this morning. If you spiritualize the resurrection, it is much less threatening. Look at verse 36. We'll pick this up. 
Luke 24, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, this is after the road to Emmaus, Jesus himself stood among them, and that's the 11 disciples. And he said to them, peace to you. And they were startled and frightened, and they thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Now, in this passage, you have two parties. You've got the 11 disciples on the one hand, and you have Jesus on the other hand. Jesus is revealed in this passage. The 11 disciples respond. Jesus reveals himself with a message of peace. The disciples respond with a message of panic based on what they saw. And it's described in verse 37. Verse 37 at the beginning, ESV says they were startled and they were frightened. Now, startled is a very technical term in the New Testament. It's only used twice. And both references are actually in the Gospel of Luke. And startled, most, most people suggest that this means it's just a synonym for fear, that they were terrified. Uh, um, they, were, they were shocked. They were gripped with fear. But the other use of this term in Luke doesn't mean that at all. Instead, it would suggest that to be startled means to be shocked and, and to find something totally unexpected. They were floored by what had happened. They had no idea that this could actually be, could be happening in front of them. You could read this text literally and you could say something like, how could this be, right? Am I seeing what I really think I'm seeing with the resurrected Christ before me? Now, this, the second phrase has much more to do with fear. The second phrase is the, the word we get phobia from. It's an added prefix to it in Greek. It makes it even stronger. You might say that the disciples were scared but then you could even add to it that they were scared out of their wits when they saw this, this figure in front of them. And verse 37 tells us why. They thought they saw a spirit. Some of your translations will say they, th- they thought they saw a ghost. Right? Um, J.R.R. Tolkien is one of my favorite authors, and The Lord of the Rings is one of my favorite stories. And at the end of The Fellowship of the Ring is when Gandalf dies. Right, he, he falls into this pit, kind of trying to slay the monster, and the fellowship of the ring is broken, and there's no more Gandalf. Right at the beginning of the, of the two towers, you've got the fellowship split apart, and this group of the guys is kind of walking through the woods, and they keep hearing and they keep seeing this thing that's called the white wizard, and nobody knows what's the, what's the white wizard or who's the white wizard. And J.R.R. Tolkien describes what the fellowship saw when they laid eyes upon this white wizard, and, and here's, how he, here's how he pens this. He says, Gimli's axe leaped from his grasp and fell ringing to the ground. The sword of Aragon, stiff in his motionless hand, blazed with a sudden fire. Legolas gave a great shout and shot an arrow into the air, and it vanished into the flame. And they all gazed at him. His hair was white as snow, and his eyes under his deep brows were bright, piercing, as the rays of the sun, power was in his hand. And between wonder, joy, and fear, they stood, and they found no words. Gandalf appears to them in the woods, and he appears like he's a spirit. They are terrified out of their minds, and they don't even know what they're looking at until finally they realize it's Gandalf. And the same, same reaction is happening to the disciples as they look upon the resurrected Christ. The disciples had the same reaction to the resurrection, really, that our world has to the resurrection and to the modern mind. Verse 38, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? They can't believe what they're seeing, and so automatically they just doubt it. They don't, even, they don't know what's going on. If Jesus really appeared just as a ghost or as a spirit then what an, what an amazing appearance it would have been, right? But if that's true, it doesn't have to affect my life. It doesn't have to change anything about me. But if Jesus truly arose from the grave and he announced that he would resurrect from the grave beforehand, he actually carried that out based on God's power. If Jesus really took hold of the keys of death 
and appeared to the disciples in a physical, bodily form, then Jesus is at the same time more wondrous and more threatening than we ever could imagine. And the message of the gospel becomes not only our greatest hope, but it also becomes a terrifying truth in all of our hearts. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, Talk to me about the truth of religion, and I'll listen gladly. Talk to me about the duty of religion, and I will listen submissively, but don't come to me talking about the consolation or the comforts of religion, or I shall suspect that you do not understand. If you look for truth, you, may, you might find comfort in the end. But if you look for comfort, you will not find either truth or comfort, only soft soap and wishful thinking, and in the end, despair. The resurrected Christ is threatening, not only to the disciples, but it's threatening to all of us as we think about it. To spiritualize the resurrection would be much less threatening for our lives. Number two, to distance yourself from Jesus would be much less demanding. All right, the disciples are just like most modern Americans. They're very skeptical in this passage. And verse 38 told us why. All right, first, their feelings, right? We get a little bit about what the disciples are sensing, what their mood is like and what they're feeling. They're alarmed, they're surprised, they're fearful when they see the resurrected Christ. Number two, they had a lack of perception. Doubts begin to arise in all of their hearts. Look down at verse 39. Jesus says, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Uh, last Christmas, by the way, we've got some special guests on this side. Mike and Marilyn Slaymaker are back in the, in the congregation. Welcome back to the church. Glad you guys are, are able to come back. Uh, last Christmas, the Slaymakers gave us a wonderful, wonderful Christmas present. They told us to load the kids in the van. And they took us out to that living, the live nativity scene just down the highway here. And we have never been to a live nativity scene before and really didn't have any, any idea what to expect except for the things that we heard from people and, and what this thing was all about. And so if you've never been to the live nativity, it's at Christmas time. Most people put up a little um, statuette, the nativity scene in their front yard. It's a little stable and you see baby Jesus in there and angels, and they're all lit up and all these other things. The live nativity scene is a little different. This is a, a whole program, and you walk through this trail, and it goes step by step, stage by stage. Really, not just the story of the birth of Christ, but, but the story of Scripture. They start in the Old Testament. They make their way all the way to the birth of Christ, and then to the cross, and even to the resurrection, and it was great. And, and so you don't just have statues. You have real people, and they're acting out these scenes. And and of course, we're going through these things with all of our kids, and they're just mesmerized by this. They see people that look like Moses and Elijah and, and all these other figures, like quoting Scripture verses, and there's real animals there. There's fountains, there's water, there's real shelters, and, and it looks almost like they recreated Bethlehem, and you're, and you're walking through the town and, and what you would possibly have seen in the first century uh, when Jesus was born. And it was really amazing because my kids were, they were fascinated by it. And they were going up and they were touching all the stuff and the, you know, the, the fire pits. They were getting really close to the fire pits and all these things that they had on display and, and they were touching the animals. But then we got to Jesus, like the uh, adult Jesus after the birth. And those of you guys who went to live nativity this year, you know, like, Jesus looked exactly like the Jesus that you have in the storybooks. He was, you know, the white Jesus with the long hair and the flowing robes and all these other things. And at that moment, Kennedy, my smallest, our, our youngest daughter, she does something incredible. She hadn't gone up and touched, she's waving in the back in case you want to see Kennedy next to Noel back there. She, hadn't, she hasn't gone up and touched anybody at this point in time. But for whatever reason, she sees Jesus there, this actor that plays Jesus, and she's just got to go up and touch him. She's got to go and see if this is like legit. Is this guy really Jesus? I need to, if this is Jesus and he looks like Jesus, all the books that I've read about Jesus, then I need to go and touch Jesus. For some reason, 
Jesus appealed to her sense of touch. And she knew that if she could get, just go and touch him, that the reality of, of who he was and, and his existence would be real to her. Now, it's interesting how Jesus appeals to the disciples in this passage. He's going to make three appeals, okay? The first thing he does in this passage is he appeals to their sight, to their vision. So look down at verse 39. It begins with a command. Jesus says to the disciples, See, look, behold, my hands and my feet. And the reason I love this passage about Jesus revealing himself to the disciples is because Jesus doesn't first give them this ooey-gooey feeling and make them feel like everything is going to be great and comfortable in their life. The very first thing that Jesus does is he appeals to their external sight, not their internal emotions. And he says, look with your eyes, sense, what are you seeing in front of you? He identifies, identifies himself emphatically. Right? Literally, we should read this, see my hands and feet, I am, ego and me. But then there's an added um, pronoun after that. I am, it is myself, I am here. It's literally me. But then the, step goes, the text goes even uh, a step further. Okay, so first, Jesus appeals to their sight. Second, he appeals to their physical touch. He asks them to come, to come and to touch him. Jesus is not a phantom. He is not a ghost. He is not just a spirit. They are not in some kind of spiritual trance. There's, this is not a vision that they're beholding. He appeals physically to their touch. And the reality of Jesus is before them. He appeals to their sight, he appeals to their touch, and then finally, he appeals to their minds and to their intellect. A spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see that I have. And, you know, and I know it's Easter time, and we pull out extra chairs in the back, and a lot of guys are here that aren't normally here, and we all want just a, a really nice, good Easter sermon, right? Just give me something that's encouraging, something that gives me hope something that makes me feel better so I can go home and have Easter lunch with my family. And, and Jesus gives this invitation to the disciples, and he says to them, he says, come and see. The second thing he says is come and touch. The third thing he says is come and think. Don't check your brain at the door. Use your reason. Use your intellect. Here's a question for you. What would have happened if the disciples would have just walked away and said, Nah, I don't believe this for a second. This is, this is ridiculous. People don't rise from the grave. There's no way that I'm seeing what I'm seeing. I'm out of here. Uh, this is just ridiculous. If that was true, then you could absolutely say that God could care less about our bodies. If that was true, if, if Jesus didn't, physically appear and and physically arise bodily from the grave, then it's less demanding on us as Christians, right? Because now diseases don't really matter. The sick and the hurting and physical bodies aren't primarily our main concern in life. Now, the Christianity doesn't demand that we meet physical needs of real physical people. It doesn't matter if we Uh, attend to the poor and attend to the needy and take care of widows and orphans and their physical needs and their physical bodies. When Jesus comes up from the grave with a physical body, it says that Christianity is more concerned about materialistic physical bodies than any other religion on the planet. Every other religion wants to make things about spiritual realities. Jesus makes things about a physical reality, including our physical bodies. Tim Keller puts it this way, if the resurrection was true, it means we can't live our lives the way we want. It also meant we don't have to be afraid of anything. With our physical bodies, we don't have to be afraid of Roman swords, not cancer. We don't have to be afraid of anything. But distancing yourself from the bodily resurrection of Jesus is much less demanding. Spiritualizing the resurrection is much less threatening. Finally, number three, if you refuse to believe Jesus, it is much less redeeming. And these are some of my 
favorite verses in Luke's account of the resurrected Christ. Look at verse 41. While they still disbelieved, and I I think the disciples are in a process of, this is kind of like amazement, and they're coming to their senses, they're coming to believe here. Verse 41, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you have anything here to eat? The guy's been out for three days, right? He's hungry. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before him before them. So, Awana, kids, I know you guys are back in Awana this week, and, and here's your Awana verse for the week. Luke 24, 42. 2, 4, 4, 2. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, right? I love this verse. Thank you, Jesus, for this verse. Amen. I'm going to sit under a tree, and I'm going to meditate on this verse, lay soul. I just want to sit in the meadow. Luke 24, 42. This brings such joy to my heart, glory to God. A country preacher comes out when I come across verses like this. What is this verse doing in the Bible? Why is this here? And whoever came up with these verse clarifications that said this is going to be a verse on its own, what were they thinking by making that its own verse? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. All right. And first of all, every single verse of Scripture is important. It's there for a reason. Nothing is superfluous. Nothing is frivolous. It is absolutely there for a reason. The Greek word for broiled fish is ichthus. You've probably heard that before. All right, so if you drive behind some people's cars, if you drive behind the Bender's Suburban, you'll see a number of ichthus fish on the back of their car. This is the, uh, this is the Jesus fish. This is the, the Greek word where we get ichthus, this is the broiled fish interpretation. And actually, the early church developed that word ichthus into an acronym. So when you look at the beginning letters of, of the word ichthus, it would mean, they fleshed it out to mean Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. It was an acronym. And most people, most historians think that it was a, it was a symbol for the persecuted church. So that instead of identifying themselves with the cross to where they'd easily be identified as Christians, persecuted Christians would use the symbol of the fish to identify themselves. There's a a story, I don't know how much legitimacy there is to it, but that if you were wondering about another person and you came up to them and met them along the way, if they were a Christian, you would draw the half circle of the fish in the dirt or in the ground. And if that person was a Christian, they would come back and they would draw the other half circle and they would complete the picture of the ichthus, and then you know that this person could be trusted, that they were part of the community of faith, that they were your brother and your sister in Christ. But more importantly than that, Jesus is eating a meal with his disciples. He is sitting down and he is taking food with them. And Daryl Bach has got a great commentary on the Gospel of Luke. It's two volumes. He says this, by Jesus eating this meal shows that it is Jesus and not a phantom. It also indicates, listen to this, he says, table fellowship and oneness. At the end of the Civil War and after the surrender of the South, um, uh, there was a a little Episcopal church in in, um, Richmond, Virginia, where believers were gathered together for one of the very first church services after the war was over. And it was an old church building, uh, much like the church building that we actually had over here in town off of Topeka. In this Episcopal church, there was two levels. There was a main level to the church, and then you had a balcony that sat above a second level where you could sit. And at this point in time, all of the white families, influential families, uh, significant families at that time would sit on the main level with their children The slaves and the African Americans would sit in the balcony. That was reserved for them. And so when it came time to take the Lord's Supper in in this Episcopal church, which they did on a weekly basis, they would serve two Lord's Suppers. They would give the supper to the family sitting on the first level, and then they would take a a separate Lord's Supper for the slaves uh, sitting in the balcony. Something 
totally shocking happened that Sunday. After the surrender and after the war was over, this African-American gentleman who was a slave came down the stairs from the balcony, walked right down the middle of the aisle to come up and take the Lord's Supper with the families on the first level. And what happened after that was even more shocking because there's this elderly, white, real big bearded guy that saw all of this happening. When he sees it happening, he stands up and he links arms with the slave that had come down to take the Lord's Supper. They go to the front of the church and they take the Lord's Supper together. That elderly guy with the big beard, the white guy, was a general. His name was General Robert E. Lee, a very significant person at the time. What Jesus does here in eating this meal and taking a, a piece of broiled fish, right? Luke twenty four forty two. You got to be kidding me here, right? What he does is he initiates te- table fellowship with his disciples. Eating together was a symbol that two parties that once were hostile against one another are now joined in together, and they are one. It communicated to the unfaithful disciples, every single one of them except for the beloved disciple had abandoned Jesus, had turned away from Jesus at the cross, and they fled and they got out of there. Jesus comes back and he reappears to them and he has a meal with them. It symbolized forgiveness, a new start, reconciliation, and all the great truths that we have of the gospel. And it displayed that their failures and their shortcomings as they abandoned and they were unfaithful to Christ are not the last word with God. It symbolized that grace is more powerful than sin. It symbolized that there was nothing that they could do that could separate them from the love of Christ. That this was about what Jesus had done, not about what they do. Most of all, This meal was an invitation to redemption. And and as you read through Luke 24, you're not going to find a word of redemption in this account. Specifically, if you look for the word redemption, it is not here. But underneath what's going on in Luke 24, and underneath what has happened in the whole entire gospel of Luke, is this one central key theme of redemption. Redemption is such a key word as you think about the resurrection of Christ. At its core, redemption means to be set free by paying a price. And there's a close connection between the redemption that Jesus bought and the resurrection of Jesus' body. Scripture says that at the moment that Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they were held in bondage to the slavery of sin. They were chained to their sin. Romans 6 says that all humanity is in slavery to sin. The Bible pictures man apart from Christ as a prisoner. We are all chained to sin. Sin is our master. It is a power over us. And no matter what we do, none of us have the ability to break the chains of sin on our, on our own. None of us have the ability to take the slavery of sin and set ourselves free from that slavery. The word redemption begins with a two-letter prefix that puts it in the same category as, as many other words. It begins with the word re, okay? A prefix. It, it's in the same category as return. So to return to something is to, to turn back to where you once were. It's in the same category of the word to rebuild. So if you rebuilt something, you, you build again something that once was. Redemption, redemption suggests that there was an original state of affairs. There was a way that things once were. And that to be redeemed means we can actually go back to the way things once were. But redemption also shows that there was a departure from what was right and what God created. Sin degraded, destroyed, and deteriorated what once was, what God once created as good and holy and perfect. And in order to free us from the slavery of the way things are and turn us back to the way things once were, we had to be redeemed. We had to be purchased out of the slavery of sin and the price 
according to Scripture, was the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. How do we know that His shed blood fulfilled the price of the slavery of our sin? The answer is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is God's stamp of approval. That the certificate of debt that was against every one of us because of our sin and our participation in it has been canceled because of what Jesus did on the cross. The resurrection takes redemption to its fullest and its ultimate level. And as we close, I just want to give a a couple thoughts to you. Number one, God meets our human needs, God meets our human doubts, excuse me, with divine revelation. God meets our human doubts with divine revelation. Keller's book, A Reason for God, he fleshes this out, and he says this. He challenges believers and unbelievers to look at doubt in a radically different way. All of us are going to struggle with doubt, okay? So faith without doubt is like blood without white blood cells. It's just not going to do what it's supposed to do. And doubt can actually be a really healthy and a good thing for the Christian. But you can't go through life with these pat answers that smart skeptics can debunk in a second because of their doubts, right? And we can't go out through the rest of our life and depend on what grandma and grandpa believed or mom and dad believed because that's not a sufficient answer for people's doubts today either. So it's not just a matter of your faith when you think about your doubts. It's a matter of the faith of the people around you. It's a matter of your family, your friends, your neighbors, all right, so when you wrestle with your doubts, it's not just your doubts that you're wrestling with. It's the doubts of the people that are around you. The, di- the disciples saw the resurrected Christ, and they doubted in their hearts. They didn't know what was going on. Jesus doesn't downcast them. He doesn't, he doesn't say anything negative about their doubts. He simply meets their doubts with answers and a revelation of who He is. He answers every single one of their doubts. And all doubts, which you have to realize, all doubts are really an alternative set of beliefs. So to doubt that belief A is true is to believe that belief B is true. There's no neutrality in doubts. Actually, if you doubt something on the one hand, then you place your faith, you believe in something on the other hand. So if you say, I don't believe in the resurrection because I don't see people rising up out of the grave, you must recognize that that statement in and itself is an act of faith. You are trusting and you are believing that it's not possible for any person to resurrect from the grave. Keller says this to believers and to unbelievers. Every doubt is based on a leap of faith. And all of us really need to doubt our doubts, whether we're believers or unbelievers. What Luke 24 says to the doubting disciples is this, look how I have revealed myself. Look at the revelation of who I am. God doesn't turn away the disciples because of their doubts. He answers their doubts with the revelation of who he is. The stronger you are in the revelation of the divine, the less you will be eaten up by the realization of your doubts. The stronger you are in the revelation of the divine the less you'll be eaten up by the realization of your doubts. Number two, God meets our human death with divine resurrection. God meets our doubts with revelation. He meets our death with resurrection. It really is true that the resurrection changes everything. And the reason is, is this. The one thing in life that no one else can contain God can control. The one thing in life that nobody else has the power over, God overpowered through Christ and the resurrection. The most that sin and death could do to Jesus was to kill him. But death could not hold him. Death could not keep him in the grave. In our time, in our culture, we look to so many things for safety, for comfort, for security. We look to health care, we look to our retirement accounts, we look to technology, we look to education, we look to science. All of these things we hope will provide the answers, the deepest answers that we desperately need. 
None of those things can conquer death. At the end of the day, nobody has figured out how to overcome death. The resurrection says Jesus can, and he did. And the one who holds the keys of death, if you want to make your way through it, you got to go through him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. For anybody to come to the Father, they must come through me. All right. Let's pray together. Thank you so much for coming out on an Easter morning. I think we've got one more song that we're going to sing before we go.